He's just the nice. Yes. Yes. He's right. just, he's just and what else are yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, thank you for joining us in person. And we have some people on Zoom as well. Uh, thank you for coming from Cold Case, South Dakota, and to celebrate National Library Week. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, so happy to introduce our local author, Chris, who is here to talk about her upcoming book, Somebody Knows. Uh, Chris is an author of three books. It's only here, the humorous self-help book about living with hair loss, and an award-winning novels, Vacant Eyes, and Borrowed Memories, all of which are available at our collection. You can purchase from her afterwards. Um, Chris is a mother of four, my grandmother of four, and lives with her husband, Doug, the other Clint Eastwood. So, um, here's <laughs> yeah. so I'll leave it up to her. Thank you. <laughs> So we're all here to hear about cold cases. And this, I have a feeling that I'm going to get a lot of um, fans of the ID television station, cold case files, forensic files, shows like that. Yeah, that's it's an obsession for me. Um, I've always been interested in it. So technically, what is a cold case? That depends on the agency involved in investigating them. And some say it's a case that's been inactive and hasn't had any new leads for three years. And some say it's one year. Depends on who it is that is investigating and how much manpower they have. Um, in any case, they're not closed as much as they are inactive. Um, my standard for this book is one year. As, as it is, cases were added to this list, my list, even this year that were not even in my sights uh, a year or two ago. And so that's kind of sad <laughs> to think that I'm picking up cases as it goes. Um, in fact, one of my friend's son went missing uh, two years ago now, it was just two years last month and he still has not been found. And so his story is in my first book. Mm. A lot of this is that they, a lot of the, I mean, it's really sad that a lot of these cases won't be solved and that this book could be an ongoing project, which is a little overwhelming for me and a little depressing <laughs> because at the rate we're going, especially with Native Americans, there are so many cases that we don't even know about, much less um, have on file and, and have no leads. So um, as anyone who watches any of the ID or a &E channels, you probably know that the first 48 hours of an investigation are crucial. The odds of solving a case in, of solving a case drops by 50% if it's not solved within the first 48 hours, which is a little alarming. Um, that's part of the reason why I included stories that are a year old, at least a year old. Um, I feel it's similar to that 48 hour window in that the memories are fresher than like at the three year mark that some agencies call a cold case. Um, evidence and clues are easier to obtain. Um, um, and, you know, like vehicles, I mean, you within a year you have pretty good luck of tracking down that vehicle or seeing that they still have it maybe even still finding evidence in it or apartments or houses or on electronic devices um, and even evidence in police custody is more likely to be safe and secure than it would be after three or more recording in progress Got a question, Got a question. <laughs> um, so that's something to consider and naturally Evidence um, like body fluids tend to degrade, so the sooner you can get to them, the better. So that's kind of why I set that rule for my book. Um, another and more honest answer is that I feel that the public pressure to solve crimes within the year are, is higher. Um, the number of people talking about it, the, um, the number of people still desperate for answers, uh, rumors and whispers and emotions are still on high flow. So those are the things that I think you need to tap into when you're working on a, when you're working on a new case. Um, I feel like it's easier to, to keep attention on a case than it is to bring people back to it. So that's kind of another reason why I wanted to include 
stories that were recent as one year old. Why did I start this project? Um, because dropping a bed on my foot repeatedly wasn't painful enough. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to wonder. <laughs> it's, it's become quite a job. And I anticipated having the first book out a couple of years ago, but that was when I thought I had 30 cases. And now it's, it's overwhelming. Um, I've always been interested in cold cases and crime solving. And some of it is just wanting to see justice done, um, see the bad guys get their comeuppance, you know, and I love mysteries. That's my novels. Um, initially, I toyed with the idea of writing about cold cases because of Pamela Jackson and Cheryl Miller. And you're all familiar with those girls. Um, I was obsessed with that story. They were from our area, and um, many of our family and friends and neighbors knew them or knew of them. And then they were found three miles from our home. So, you know, honestly, I was a little mad that I didn't find them myself, that I hadn't driven down to that creek and looked in the creek for them myself. I was that obsessed with it. I mean, what a feeling would that be to, to solve a decades old case? I mean, that had to be just amazing to be able to, to solve that. Um, there are a few, let me start thinking, why can't, why can't I still do it? Just because these girls were found. This was never all about just the girls. It was about cold cases. And, and I thought I can still do this. I know um, of several cases, three personally, um, Dana Adamson from, from Centerville. She was the daughter of a friend of ours who was murdered. John Rice, who was a classmate of mine who was murdered in Jackson, Wyoming, and his case was never solved. And Kelly Robinson, who was the daughter of uh, another friend of mine. So I decided to forge ahead with this, with this project anyway. Um, I made the announcement about three years ago. And at that time, I was under the impression given to all of South Dakota and me by the then attorney, Marty Jackley. Um, who said there was about 30 cases that he knew of that were unsolved. So I contacted their office and asked if they had a list of those cases. <clears throat> and they wrote back and said, we have no reservations about this project. Good luck. No, we don't have a list. Um, you'll have to contact each county. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I thought, wait a minute. How do they even know there's 30 cases if they don't have a list? Why would they not want to share that with me? I didn't understand that because I'm just some Yahoo who wants to know maybe. I, didn't, I have no idea. So I did. I wrote to every single county sheriff in the state. I heard back from maybe 10 and they said, way to go. Good luck. Um, great project. And it's important and worthy. And we don't have any cases in our, in our county. <laughs> So I sent emails, I sent more emails to the remaining counties, never heard back. Then I sent snail mail and heard from maybe four more and um, same thing. And none of them had anything to tell me apparently because they, they weren't giving me any information. Basically all I was asking for in my emails and in my uh, regular letters was basically a, um, a press release. I just wanted the basic facts about when they were found, um, what was the manner of death, um, you know, what was their name, what was the date. That's basically all I need so that I can research it myself. If I had a list of names and basic facts, I could find, I could find out the rest. And, and I still didn't get it. So um, then I started calling sheriff's offices and that didn't, that didn't um, garner any results either because they're busy. They're, they're out of the office. They can't take your call right now. They're on another call or whatever. I got nothing. So I suppose um, it got to, it had more to do with maybe their feelings of the futility of it all. Um, the sense that if there were leads, they would have followed them by now. Maybe it was a matter of funds or manpower that they just couldn't spare to even write me back. Um, so, and maybe there were more pressing matters in their county. I'm, you know, I get it. I'm a nobody, but dang it. <laughs> I'll be doing you a favor if this is successful. So anyway, how did I start? So I started searching these cases just trying to find them myself. 
And I use keywords like unsolved crimes, South Dakota, um, unsolved murder, South Dakota, missing persons, South Dakota. And of course you have to spell out South Dakota because if you don't, then you get San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Every time, my South Dakota map. Okay, so those produce probably 30 to 40 cases, especially when I could find links on pages like Kate Yellow. They always do a cold case series in the summer, and it's fascinating, but they always post links to other sites, and that's just been incredibly helpful. So two years ago, I thought I'd found them all at 57. I thought, wonderful, this is all the cases I have. I should be able to get them all in one book. Then I heard a story on Kate Yellow that Angela Kennedy <coughs> did about Alizé Millard. And I'm like, wait a minute, I don't know anything about this story. How did that slip past me? And I hadn't heard anything about him. So, um, so I wrote to Angela and she wrote back and said, here are some links to some pages you can find more information. And uh, we also have on, um, on our news story and you can follow those. And so um, that helped a lot. Um, and then I mentioned my project. I mentioned that I was doing this book on South Dakota's cold cases. So they came to my house and interviewed me. And by then I had 83 cases. That was last summer, last June. So now I figured I'd need two books. That's doable. Um, and by the way, Angela Kennedy has agreed to write the foreword for the book, so that's kind of exciting because she's like 60 minutes of South Dakota. <laughs> she shows up at your door, you better have a lawyer. <laughs> so, so now I'm up to 155 cases. And I thought, oh, that's got to be all. That's got to be, please God, that's got to be all. And I recently found a site that listed another 38 names, all of them Native American, which have not been verified as unsolved cases, just a list of names, but I still need to investigate just like I did with all the others. Those are all my cases right there. Each one of those file folders is a person. Some of them are filled and some are not, depending on how much information I found on them. Um, all of, and if all of these cases, including the last 38 that I got, are deemed unsolved or suspicious circumstances or disappearances, then that would make 193 cases since 1969. And 77% of them are Native American, which is sobering. It, it's, it's utterly staggering. And um, just to be clear, any that I find that are unsolved, suspicious, or disputed, I intend to publish. Um, it won't all be in the first book, of course, because that's way too many for anybody to bite off in one reading. That's, that would be grueling, I think. The first book will be about 50 to 55 cases, and I'm hoping it'll be out within the next month, month and a half. And so this is my process for investigating these crimes. I started out Googling every single possible combination of keywords I could imagine, and through trial and error, discovered that including the county name helped immensely. I don't know why that narrows it down. Maybe because the sheriff's office gets involved and it's the sheriff that puts out the report. So somehow li linking the, con the county to the case seems to pull up more um, results. Unfortunately, um, not all newspapers have digitized, digitized their articles. Uh, so many of them are just simply photos of articles that are listed on a separate site that has a paywall in other words, they want me to buy a subscription to read it or view it. And I can't afford to buy a subscription for every article I want to read or for every paper. I mean, that would be dozens and dozens of newspapers. But um, I'm not going to admit that I found a way around that. <laughs> Law enforcement here or online. But I found a way around it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I gotta do what I gotta do, you know? Um, <laughs> but, I mean, we have a subscription to the Argus Leader and they won't even let me read it online. I'm like, what do I have to do? I mean, criminy. Anyway, so at least I had names. And often that's all I found, especially in cases of Native American cases, because, um, because you can't find a lot of details. It's not widely publicized on reservations. Um, but I just did the best I could. Um, so I'd add it to my list. And later when I'd go back, 
to find more information about the victim, I realized that I couldn't always find my way back to the original source. I had followed sites like KELO that listed cases that followed the links and I followed the links to other pages with more names and more links and followed those. And somehow I end up way, way off in some foreign internet land without a passport, fresh underwear or money to get home. <laughs> so <laughs> I felt stranded. And, and so I would find myself on these obscure sites and, and try and gather as much information as I could. Um, but, you know, it, a lot of cases, especially with Native Americans, you can't find a lot of information. You can just find a name. Then um, I ran into the issue of I'd find the names and I'd, case, I'd find the cases, and this was fairly early on, but I forgot where I found them. Am I a techno wizard? No. Am I getting better at it? Also no. <laughs> now, when I find information on a case or a person, I print it out and I put it in my file. There's, there's a reason for that, because trying to link back every time you want to look up something. Do you know how many tabs are open on my computer right now? Probably two dozen. My, my son would have a fit and fall in it. He, he hates it when I, he doesn't like me using the computer at all. So, <laughs> anyway. So as long as we're on the subject of my process and internet sleuthing, to further complicate things, because easy isn't good enough and painful enough, um, I wanted to not only include the details of each case, but a tribute to or about the victim from a family member or a friend. And, um, and that involved finding the family member or the friend when possible. Some of these victims were transients um, or the families knew very little about them because the case happened so long ago. They're so far removed from memory. Um, so there will always be stories, there will probably be a lot of stories in these books that don't have family tributes or don't have a lot of information about their case. You know, it might say she was found beaten next to a building. That's all there is, you know. They may be a cause of death. That might be all I have. And then I, if I can't find family members, I mean, that's, it's really sad to think that someone's life is summed up in two or three paragraphs. And to me, that's just heartbreaking. Um, so that's why I add um, the, the tributes for missing persons cases. Also, um, I need permission to print photos. So it's really hard to, to post a missing persons photo with our story without a photo of them. You know, it was like, do I publish it without permission and take the chance that a family member is going to complain? You just don't know. And the only way I can get around that is by, is by not taking any money from the book. It's by donating all the pro profits from it. So that might be an option just to, just to donate all the proceeds. Um, so uh, finding family members has become another part of the project. It's very time consuming and it's rabbit hole, amateur sleuthing part of the project, but I'm starting to understand why private investigators get paid so much and why writers have heavy bottoms. So <laughs> <laughs> a lot of button chair stuff. So just as an example of my finding family, family members, I found an old, very brief article about a murder that had never been solved in South Dakota. This person lived kind of a wild life and at the time of their death, involved with drugs, dangerous biker gangs, um, things like that. And this person was set to testify at an upcoming trial the following week, but was murdered the week before the trial occurred. So that important witness was gone. At first I thought I wasn't gonna be able to find any information about this person. I figured it'd be one of those two paragraph lonely stories without any significant details. But I found one little sentence in one of these obscure articles that I had to dig for that said they were from a town in Iowa. So I looked for a family member with that name in that town and found several. Finally found an obituary for this person's mother who listed this person as preceding her death. It listed the sister's names. Then I found sister's names in the white pages in the town that was listed in that obituary and found a couple of them that could be her. And finally, I made a couple phone calls and got a hold of this woman. And um, turns out this murder person wasn't an informant. 
but an undercover agent, an undercover narcotics agent. And in South Dakota, she was listed as an informant. She was minimized to that. And in Iowa, she was she was taken, she got a letter from our governor. She had um, she had a flag presented to her. They had a speech. All the detectives that worked with her were her pallbearers. You can't tell me that's informant. That's an undercover agent. And she was treated with the best respect. And so I feel like I'm so glad I pursued that. That that story is going to be correctly told. And so um, I, I feel like that's one of the most important parts of this book is showing that these victims are necessary. They're valued and loved and cherished and needed. And I could have missed all that. Um, so following all those rabbit holes and in all the sleuthing and the frustrating parts of the project is probably, it's frustrating, but it's probably one of the most fulfilling. Um, and incidentally, some of those white paper searches, the white, white pages searches, you know, that you can do, sometimes they want you to pay too, but a lot of times you can find them where it lists past towns they lived in. It'll list um, possible relatives. And sometimes it'll list phone numbers and addresses, which has been incredibly helpful. Um, one of the most valuable search tools that I have found is Facebook. Um, I've sent message requests, re message requests, can't send a message to somebody you know, it goes into their request file and it's kind of like spam mail, you know, they never see them. They're worthless. <laughs> and I've sent several friend requests to random people in the efforts of finding family members of these victims or friends. And um, they don't know me. So of course they don't accept, you know, then I have to resort to commenting on their posts like some creeper. <laughs> if that option's available, sometimes it's not, or finding a friend of theirs who has a, the comment section open so I can comment on their page and say, hi, my name's Chris Wevick. I'm trying to reach so-and-so about their missing son. Can you please have them contact me? Sometimes that works. Sometimes I get blocked. <laughs> I'm a creeper, okay. Because that's, that's, the, that's the typical identification there. Um, trying not to take that personally. Um, why do I need family tributes? I don't. I don't have to have them. But have you ever watched one of those 2020 shows or Dateline where they interview family or friends of the victims and they describe them as lighting up a room when they walk in or um, they give anyone the shirt off their back? They've never met a stranger. Well, I'm hoping my tributes will be a little more specific and less cliche than that. But it makes the victim more real. It makes them more human and more memorable in the eyes of the reader. Um, they realize this person was someone who was loved and cherished and needed and missed by their family and friends. And, um, and, and to be really honest, I don't want any of those people, um, I don't want their death or disappearance to be the only thing, the one thing they're remembered for, which is really sad to think that, you know, someone's death defines their whole life. So that's why I feel like it's important. And, and that part definitely has been the most challenging, not just to find them, not to find the family members, but to get them to write something, I think is overwhelming for even them. But, you know, that's why it's taking so long. I had hoped to have this out last year even, um, but I have to be patient with families of these victims as well. Um, that's my process. It's probably inefficient and rudimentary and amateurish and clumsy, but so far so good. <laughs> Take. Um, now, statistics regarding cold cases, and these are kind of so great as well. According to the television show Cold Case Files, any fans? There are over a hundred, I love how they solve crimes. I'm not so much into the shows that, that just basically show the crime, especially the show Disappearance, because they don't have an ending. They aren't found. I don't want to watch that. I want to watch the shows where the killer or abductor is found, and they catch them, and they show me how it got done. I love that. So, I mean, that's part of, part of why I'm doing this. Um, anyway, in this cold case files show, they always started out by saying there are over 100,000 cold cases in the U.S. 
and only 1% is ever solved. Isn't that heartbreaking? All of those families, all of those friends who will never likely know what happened to their loved ones. It's pretty staggering and depressing statistics, especially for the family of a murder victim, you know, especially a missing person, you know. I think that would be probably one of the hardest. Um, I, you know, y'all know Pamela Jackson, Cheryl Miller. Oscar Jackson was 102 when he died and, and his, his daughter was found five days after he died. And like he went to his grave not knowing this guy hung on, he wanted to know and never, never knew what happened to his daughter. You know, that's just the worst. Um, in South Dakota, Native Americans make up only 9% of our population, but 65% of the missing persons cases are Native American. And more than half of those missing indigenous persons are women. Native American women. Nationwide, Native American women are 10 times more likely to die from murder and four times more likely to die or to be victims of domestic violence or sexual assault. Um, according to the DOJ, crime rates experienced by Native Americans is two and a half times higher than any other nationality. And the rate of case closure is significantly lower for Native Americans as well. I think it's something like 65% of the rate of closure that they ever see. Um, we have an epidemic, it's clear. There are so many factors at play when it, when it regards Native Americans on the reservation, specifically um, poverty, alcohol, drugs, um, <coughs> physical and mental health issues, um, along with poor health care. Their, their life expectancy is much shorter, um, rampant suicide rates. And one of the biggest issues in unsolved crimes on reservations, in my opinion, is jurisdictional issues. Once a crime is deemed federal, like murder or kidnapping, it becomes the FBI's business. And law enforcement and BIA are not always kept apprised of the process or the progress in these investigations. And they've sometimes been left out altogether. Um, Often the cases are declined in investigation because of lack of evidence. Um, and then a lot of these cases, I find that the uh, um, label is slapped on the case to close it when it's clear that there are a lot more factors at play that they should have been paying attention to. Um, yeah, I might tell you about one of those later. Um, then families and local officials have to try and pursue things on their own. They do the walks and, and they, you know, they, they try and bring attention to it. They speak with their legislators. It doesn't always work and it doesn't rarely results in a, in a conviction. According to a lot of the Native American families I've talked to, um, individuals that do know of crimes, um, are afraid to talk. It's a very tight-lipped and um, untrusting community with good reason. They have good reason to be. Um, some know it's a family member and don't want to turn them in, or they're afraid of retribution by local gangs, which are also a huge problem. That, that kind of conflict uh, compounds the problem. Regardless, I tend to cover all the cases I can find. Um, how do you choose? You don't, you can't choose. Now, why do cases go cold? Um, more often it's because of lack of leads to the perpetrator. These leads can be something as simple as a witness statement, um, physical evidence, or DNA. But lacking that, they have nothing to pursue. Second, it's not the leads, but the evidence that's lacking. They might have plenty of leads, but without evidence or proven, without physical or provable evidence, they can't prosecute. So they can have all the evidence in the world. And if they don't, if they can't link it to someone, um, they can't prosecute. Um, then we have to factor in human error. Is this a suicide or homicide or accidental death? When investigators get tunnel vision or follow an inclination or a feeling rather than following science or exercising caution and all questionable crime scenes, cases can start off on the wrong track and just keep going. 
um, like saying it's a suicide or, su or assuming it's a missing person that's run away. If law enforcement classifies the case as one thing and the coroner or medical examiner determines it's questionable or vice versa, that disparity can create a vacuum where nothing happens. Um, you can't just change the cause of death or manner of death without, you, you can't do that arbitrarily. It involves more investigation, which they don't always have a, a cause to do it. Um, um, so it would take it would take both of those organizations working together to say, okay, this is questionable. Yes, we'll open it up if you'll open it up. So it, 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 it's complicated. Um, and incidentally, um, cause of death would be something like a gunshot wound and manner of death would be something like homicide, suicide, or accident. So just both of those. And, and they're different. Um, the, like, the death certificate won't show a lot of the things that are on the autopsy report. So families might never know exactly some of these details until the case is closed or if it goes to trial. Um, on that topic, some deaths that are deemed suspicious, such as car accidents or natural death, do not require autopsies. So if you were to arrive at a car accident where there's just very traumatic injuries and people are dead, then obviously we're not going to autopsy them. So on occasion, some cases deemed as accidents could be homicide staged to look like accidents. They're classified wrong, so they're never investigated. Now, this reminds me of a story on television about a woman who is planning to divorce her husband. He convinced her to take one last camping trip with him to their cabin, and he states that they left the cabin to run the town, and they got into an accident. And her injuries, according to the highway patrol that found them, her injuries were so severe that the investigating officer had a hard time believing they could be caused by this, this simple fender bender that the, that the couple had. The woman had multiple facial and head injuries. Her teeth were found in her throat and one in her lung. And it was just too much for this little accident. Then the officer began looking at the vehicle and he found a boot print on the inside of the passenger window. And that didn't make sense at all. And there was, an all, oh, there was also an unusual amount of blood for this little accident. Um, and for some reason, he was wearing his seatbelt and she wasn't. So that's suspicious in itself. Um, there was a spot on the window that had a pattern transfer from her sweater. And then blood drips on the window and inside the vehicle went down and then they went forward. And anybody who's watched any enough of these shows, you know, <laughs> she was bleeding heavily before the crash. What made that blood go forward? The forward movement of the vehicle. They crashed into the tree and boom, the blood just shot to the front. This was all evidence that the husband had staged the scene. Um, and that the, the sweater pattern in the blood on the window was also proof that she'd been bleeding before the accident. Because you can't just instantly bleed and get your, no, your arms are going to reach there first. So she was bleeding on her sleeve before it hit the window. So the, uh, they, um, he investigated all of that and discovered that he had staged the scene. And it, he was eventually arrested and convicted. And the woman's family were convicted, they were convinced that there was more to it. And the coroner is not a, a uh, accident investigator or reconstructionist, so he can't really say, you know, this was, this was, this could have been done by the accident. You know, he, he has no way of knowing. But people who work with accidents would know. Um, so using the autopsy reports and reconstructing the crime, reconstructing the accident, and reviewing the evidence is what solved this crime years later. Fortunately, the vehicle was still available when he started investigating. Now, another factor in cold cases is experience, uh, inexperience, I should say. At some crime scenes, especially in cases that are massive, like the LaDonna Mathis case, or in, or that the ones that are committed in small towns, like in the LaDonna Mathis case, um, law enforcement officials don't always have the, the um, experience to investigate properly from the beginning. And, and many times they know they're in over their head and they'll call in FBI or some other large 
larger agency from a nearby city to come in and help them investigate. Just to, you know, little towns don't see a lot of murders. So they're gonna want help from, uh, from people who deal with it a lot because they know exactly what to do. You wear the booties in, you limit how many people go in. You don't let any, anybody else on the scene. You know, there's so many things that they need to do. Um, but cases that get bundle, bungled from the start are doomed. Evidence is lost, it's never collected. Um, witnesses move away and they're never questioned. So some of these cases that are deemed suicide very likely could be murders. Um, jurisdictional authority is also another one of the problems, another one of the things that causes cases to go cold. Um, whose case is it? Um, who handles what? In the case of Tammy Haas, multiple jurisdictions were involved since her body was found across the state lines in Nebraska, but no one knows exactly where the crime or her death occurred. So that left it up to both Nebraska and South Dakota and the FBI to investigate. And things get lost in the shuffle. Um, who has the right to pursue certain witnesses and evidence and even the chain of custody? So um, that sort of thing, uh, there has to be better a better plan there, you know, better, I don't know how you do that. There has to be some kind of a plan implemented to avoid that. Um, those are huge issues for crimes that are committed on the reservations as well. It's a struggle between local law enforcement, BIA, and FBI. So what hope do we have of cold cases being solved? We have a lot of hope, in my opinion. Um, technology in regards to investigations is advancing in areas of DNA analysis. Everyone has a cell phone, so people can be tracked much easier. Um, more events are recorded. People are recording things with their phone and, um, you know, pictures and video. Um, people can be tracked. Forensic science is much more advanced and more completely, uh, more commonly employed at crimes, crime scenes and afterward. And that said, there are more people now who understand those advances and they're doing things to thwart the efforts of law enforcement like um, leaving their cell phones off or um, leaving them at home or erasing data. So um, I have no doubt though that eventually technology will allow for devices to be tracked regardless of whether the device is on or not. I'm, I'm all, almost kind of hoping that happens because there are, just like everybody has cell phones now, and it would just be invaluable, I think, if your kid got stolen to, to be able to, to track them, you know? And maybe that's something that a, a kidnapper would be aware of and get rid of the kid's phone too, who knows? But I, I don't doubt that that could happen someday. Um, also, um, there's, there are more people now, businesses and residences that have cold case, or not cold case, um, CCTV. They have closed circuit television that's much more affordable. Granted, the, the images aren't always the best because it's not as quality as some places, um, but it's helped a lot in solving crimes right away so they don't become cold cases. Um, better DNA techniques have improved the odds of solving crimes, especially cold cases. Now they can test smaller quantities of forensic samples and they can use more refined tests to create a, a profile perpetrator. Sometimes they, they can even use DNA to determine what a perpetrator looks like. They can um, figure out their heritage and their DNA type. How tall were they probably? Well, if, they're, if they're German descent and they're probably blonde or you know, so they can create almost a, uh, um, an image of what this person looks like. Um, so that's promising. Um, and in the case of Baby Andrew in Sioux Falls, y'all familiar with that one? Yeah. That was used to trace, DNA was used to trace a voluntarily submitted DNA sample back to a familial relation and the mother was found and arrested. And, um, that's, I think, is very promising because more people are voluntarily giving their DNA to these ancestry sites. And some, not all, 
allow for law enforcement officials to, to access those results to see if there's a match. In the past, investigators were only allowed access to CODIS, which is combined DNA index system, which is basically a collection of DNA um, from known felons. Um, any felony arrests, they are subjected to this DNA test. Now that people are submitting to ancestry sites voluntarily, those DNA samples can be accessed and, and they can be traced back to find victims, either unidentified victims or, uh, or crimes. Sometimes, I mean, I follow this page on Facebook, um, I think it's called The Unidentified, and there's always a new person or a body that shows up and, um, and they're trying to figure out who they are according to what tattoos they had on their body or um, taking DNA samples, trying to match it up with anybody who, you can also, if you have a family member um, who's missing, you can submit your DNA so that if they DNA a body that's found, it could possibly link back to you and then, and then you'd know if that was your, your relative. Um, sometimes the thing that fires up a, a cold case is just fresh eyes. New investigators or detectives that come onto a police force and they're interested in working with cold cases and investigating, they take those files out and they read them and they reread them and they make notes and they compare witness accounts. <laughs> and before you know it, they discover the tiniest little overlooked clue or uh, witness statement or find something in the crime scene photos that just blows open the case. Um, that kind of thing, I really have to apply because I think it takes a special investigator or detective to have the patients to sit down and reread these files over and over and over. They're hundreds of pages most of the time. Um, so that brings me to my goal in this project, another way to solve the case. I don't have any lofty expectations that this book is gonna solve any of these crimes, but that doesn't mean that I can't or don't hope it might. Um, what I hope is that this, this book gets people talking. Um, things happen when people talk. Someone in a bar brags too loud. They're drunk and feeling boisterous and loud and they brag about a crime they committed. Or someone in a, in a crowded restaurant talks a little too loud. And before you know it, someone hears them and they turn in a tip. Or someone in, the mo in a moment of weakness or bravado whispers a confession in their lover's ear. Um, perhaps this book will pricker, prickle some consciences or trigger a deathbed confession. Who knows? Or a confession by someone who's no longer loyal to the perpetrator. Could be an ex-wife who says, you know what? I alibied him at the time and I'm done. I don't want this on my conscience. And now I realize what a jerk he is, or vice versa, it could be a woman. Um, but they they just decide, I don't want, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I want to, I want to be the difference here and turn them in. I don't want to be their alibi anymore. And then, and before you know it, the perp is arrested. Um, but what I really hope for that when people start talking, that memories are sparked. And we don't know what we know. Sometimes when my family is talking about life on the farm, I was only there until I was six. And they'll talk about something, someone at school. And on any given day, I couldn't tell you more than two people's names from our one room schoolhouse. But they'll start talking about Jimmy Hagedorn and what a brat he was. I remember Jimmy Hagedorn. <laughs> That's how it works. That's how it works. It, it will, you know, shared experiences will trigger memories. And I want to get people talking. I want people to talk about these people in the book. I want them to talk about the cases. I want to talk, I want them to talk about how horrific it was, or I was there, or I saw him that night, or something. And you have no idea what you know. But those tiniest of memories, those tiniest of details can be called in as a tip. You could call in and say, you know what? I remember seeing him drive by my house about 10 after 10. And that was right around the time this person was killed. Or, wait a minute, no, he wasn't wearing that. Or, you know, just the smallest memory could, could make such a big difference in solving these crimes. And that reminds me of a case um, that was on a show about a man who leaves a bar 
after uh, spending the evening playing cards with his friends and he arrives home to find his wife has been murdered. Um, they please go back to his friends and they say, uh, was he here all night? And they're like, yeah, he was here all night. I mean, yeah, he just sat right here and played cards. And well, yeah, the only time he got up was to go make a phone call and go use the bathroom. And they're like, well, how long was he gone? Oh, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes, something like that. We weren't paying attention, we were drinking. Then, then um, one of the girls, after the wife was murdered and after things started coming out, she said, you know what, come think of it. She called the police and said, come think of it. He uh, wasn't in the lobby on the payphone. This is an old case, <laughs> back when they had payphones. He, <laughs> he wasn't in the lobby at the payphones and I didn't see him anywhere near the bathrooms. I don't know if he stepped out for a cigarette or not, but I mean, he he wasn't wearing a coat. So I figured he, was, he hadn't been outside. It was chilly, he wasn't wearing a coat. So I mean, he, was, he didn't have his coat on, is what she said. And so um, when he came back, so the police started looking into it and they, they looked at the crime scene photos and saw a coat hanging on the door that had blood spatter on it. And they went back to these witnesses and said, what kind of coat was he wearing? And they said, oh, we gave him crap about it. It was a letterman's coat, you know, like, like you get in school. You know, it's like the body part of it was a darker color with white sleeves. And the police said, um, okay, I think we solved the crime because the coat was found hanging on the closet door. He'd gone home and murdered his wife and raced back. And he might've remembered that he forgot his coat there, but he couldn't be gone too long. So he had to race back without his coat and hope nobody noticed, you know, but he ended up getting convicted of his crime. And uh, so, that's what these little these little memories that's the difference these little memories can make um i'm hoping someone remembers just a tiny little detail and in every case at the bottom of every page of the case i'm going to list local uh, law enforcement numbers and also crime crime stoppers so people can call in an anonymous tip there's absolutely no reason not to call in an anonymous tip they'll follow up on everything they, they want these off the books. So, um, and, and just to clarify, my books do include some stories that of people who died outside of our straight state or went missing outside of our state, like um, my friend John Rice or Morgan Bauer, this girl from Aberdeen who went to Atlanta and went missing, or Donna Loss, who's from Beersford, she went missing. Um, and there are two cases in the book that are considered closed. Um, <clears throat> Morgan Lewis and uh, Arnold Archambault and Ruby Brewer. Has anyone here heard of them? Oh, very intriguing. I'll tell you about it if you want. And then there are three cases in the book that were tried and acquitted. Axel Christensen from Sioux Falls and LaDonna Mathis and the boys. And then of course, Tammy Haas. Um, so that kind of wraps up what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. So now we get to guess what the five most notorious cold cases in history are. Any guesses? In South Dakota, it's not the nation. Ah, it's not the nation. Lizzie Borden. That's one. Dahlia. Black Dahlia. Black Dahlia. That's another one. <coughs> Can you give me a hint? I just want to tell you. Who killed JFK? <laughs> Pardon me? Who killed JFK? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's Jimmy Hunt? Where's Jimmy Hunt? Now, the five they list are Black Dahlia, Zodiac Killer, John Bonet Ramsey. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. And the Hall Mills murders. I'm like, I've been fascinated with cold cases all my life, and I'm 60, I'm old. <laughs> so <laughs> I've never heard of the Hall Mills murders. So I, of course I had to look it up. And it was about a pastor and uh, and his mistress who were found murdered, Ed Hall and Eleanor Mills. He was the pastor of a church and she was married to the janitor of that church and they were found killed. And um, he was shot once in the head. She was shot three times and her throat was cut and they cut out the tongue. 
my goodness, that's overkill. Someone did not like her. Um, it was, pardon me. <laughs> well, I, it was huge. Uh, a lot of people thought the wife did it. The wife was responsible. The wife and, and her two brothers. The wife of the minister. Yeah. Um, but that case never got solved. And it was just creepy. They had them laying next to each other. His arm was underneath her neck. And her hand was on his knee. And then um, she was savaged, of course. But then he was shot in the head. And a hat was placed over his face. And his business card was leaning up against his foot. <laughs> like that's twisted stuff. Wow. Yeah, it's just creepy. So um cases I would have added before the Hall Mills murders. I mean you've never heard of that. Jimmy Hoffa, Bob Crane. Know her Bob Crane. Um Jack the Ripper. He should be on that list, don't you think? Yeah. If you have any suggestions about infamous cold cases. Make sure you come over and tell me because I'll add them to my list. I might put them in the book. It'd be kind of interesting. <laughs> then people can just go on and Google it and see what, <laughs> what information they can find. Um, also, I should clarify that this book is not a true crime book in the way that um, other true crime books are. I'm not posting pictures of crime scenes and gore and things like that. I, I want to respect the families and friends of these victims. And I want to respect the victims. Um, as fascinating as some of that stuff is, I think it serves no purpose in, in trying to get results. That's the whole point of this book is to get results. So, you know, if, if, you, if you come to the book thinking you're gonna see a lot of gore and crime scene photos that come to the wrong place. Um, Another thing is I am donating the majority of the proceeds. I plan on paying for the book from the proceeds, but um, I'm planning on donating the majority of the proceeds to um, two different organizations, maybe more. One is South Dakota Network Against Family Violence and Sexual Assault. And another one, which would be a nonprofit organization that benefits South Dakota Native Americans because they are they are the most um, minimized in this case. And I haven't figured out which one that is yet. I'm thinking maybe the Red, Red Ribbon Skirt Society in, in Rapid City. Um, that's one of them. But if any of you have any suggestions in that regard, I mean, you're free to tell me that too. So for anyone who's interested, um, I'm also the author of three other books. And um, I have them right here. This one is it's only hair. It's a humorous self-help book about living with hair loss. Yes, this is a wig. I have no alopecia, so I have no hair, not one hair. I have not had to shave my legs in 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> silver linings, silver linings. I raised hogs for nine years, and I never had to wash my hair afterward. It was at home. <laughs> and I can wash my hair like like this and and leave it to dry on the thing overnight. I don't have to air, I don't have to dry it. I can fix my hair like this. I can do it the night before and put it up and go to bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> and, and just a little clue about the kind of humor that you're gonna find in this book. Um, it is not in this book because this happened after the book came out. A couple of years ago, I was being interviewed in Yankton by a newspaper. Um, he was interviewing me about the cold case book. And I was there with Nancy Haas there and, um, and a couple other people. And the guy interviewing me said, um, so tell me about this It's Only Hair book. Uh, what's that about? I said, well, it's just a humorous self-help book about living with hair loss. And he said, why would you write about that? I said, I have no hair. I have alopecia. I said, and he goes, that's a wig? And I said, yeah. And he said, wow, that's beautiful. And I said, thanks. It's from Australia. I always say that. And he said, oh, hair from down under. And I said, oh. 
<laughs> and the funny part of it was, I mean, I thought that was kind of funny. We all cracked up laughing, and he's sitting across from me, not understanding at all what he said. <laughs> and this poor man had no hair on top of his head, and he's just sitting there looking at us laughing, and then he goes, oh, <laughs> oh my word, and I couldn't see his face, but the top of his head was bright red, <laughs> so, <laughs> so mortified, and he was gracious about it, but I said, okay, I'm using that, I am using that, so <laughs> that's just the kind of funny humor you'll find in here, just funny things that happen to me, I would say it's about all different types of hair loss, not just LP show, like male and pattern, male pattern and female pattern baldness and chemotherapy hair loss, which acts actually is probably um, the majority of the buyers of the book are people going through chemo. And, um, and most of the book is about um, coping with hair loss and just living with it and, and learning to accept it and, um, and have fun with life. I mean, because it's, it's only hair, <laughs> it's only hair. So, uh, my other two books are mysteries with a little bit of a paranormal twist. Bacon Dies, which is right here, is about a woman named Bryn who is a farm wife, mother, and artist who is abducted and attacked and um, brutally assaulted and left for dead. She lives, of course. And from that attack, of which she can remember nothing, she acquires the ability to see memories in old abandoned houses. So like if walls could talk, she could walk in and hear and see things that happened throughout the life of that abandoned house. And um, she decides to use her gift to find her friend who went missing 16 years earlier. And then in the midst of that investigation, she finds out her own unsolved case might be related to her friend's disappearance. So she has to investigate her own attack and witness it because she goes back to the house where she was found and um, witness it for herself. So she's seeing her own attack as if a third person, you know, uh, which would be traumatizing in itself. So that's the first book. And um, the second book is Borrowed Memories. And it's, a, it's the second in the series, but they both stand alone. So you could read one and not the other and not feel like you're missing anything. Um, in this book, Bryn's case is still unsolved. And she is um, asked by the local sheriff to help him work on local cold cases. So that becomes her story in this book and her own case becomes kind of integral to the story as well. So um, those are, oh, and I should tell you, Bacon Eyes um, was a bronze Ippy winner in 2018 and a finalist in four other competitions, which was very exciting for his first novel. And Borrowed Memories last summer um, won a, uh, a finalist in one of the awards I entered, and then it was a uh, it was a silver falchion winner of best supernatural, and then the silver Fel silver falchion book of the year at Killer Nashville last summer in Nashville, which is incredibly exciting. So, congratulations! Thank you, thank you. It was like the highlight of my writing career. Um, so, um, anyway. They, it was it was fun having them become winners thus you know and I would say you know that was that was probably my highlight thus far but if this cold case helps solve any crimes I will stop wearing my metal spit that's how important it is <laughs> so <laughs> I will be over here signing books and if you have any questions um, I'd be happy to take them now anybody um, on Zoom, they wanted to know if you would uh, talk about in future cases. Yes. That, um, if you wouldn't mind. Absolutely. And maybe maybe that's what all of you came to hear. Because <laughs> there are so many. Um, I think some of the most intriguing cases that I have are um, the one of Morgan Lewis, which is considered closed. Actually, two of them, the two that are considered closed, are two that I found the most intriguing. Morgan Lewis was a professor um, at NSU up in Aberdeen. And he was, oh, 40 something, 47 maybe. And um, he, he had just moved to Aberdeen a few months earlier and his partner was in California yet trying to decide whether to move here. And Morgan was gonna tell him if he liked it well enough to stay. Morgan um, 
one guy, he was very involved in school, very involved in a lot of different organizations, um, working with the kids, um, teaching different languages to different people. And uh, one day he was found dead, shot dead on the sidewalk in front of his building at 7.30 in the morning. And this is so weird. He was shot behind the left ear. He's right-handed, shot behind the left ear on the sidewalk. 50 feet away is a dumpster and they found the gun in the dumpster underneath the trash and they called it suicide. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they considered it closed. There was a lot of upheaval in the police department at that time, and I don't know if that had anything to do with it. It shouldn't have, but um, not too many people in Aberdeen are satisfied with that result. And so I'm putting it in the book. I didn't even tell them I was looking into this case. I just I'm putting it in there. Um, <laughs> so that one I think needs looking at. Um, so it's just really strange. And, and the nice thing about this particular, not nice, I shouldn't say that, the advantageous part of this is that I'm not going through police. I don't have to depend on their version of what happened. And there are conflicting reports as to whether there was a blood trail from the body to the dumpster or from the dumpster. Um, he would have to shoot himself in the head Hide the, how do you do that? In a dumpster underneath the trash. If you wanted to make it look like murder and not suicide, you wouldn't shoot yourself in the head. You would shoot yourself in the body where you had a few seconds to stumble away, hopefully without a blood trail. But there are, there are conflicting reports about whether there's a blood trail or not. To me, someone who's gonna shoot themselves in the head they, they can't anticipate that they're going to stay, long, stay alive long enough to hide a gun. And, and why really, would they even be thinking about that? Right. Someone who's going to commit suicide wants it to be over with. They want it to be done, and they don't care what somebody finds afterwards. They're done. But to, and then the gun had no prints on it. He's going to shoot himself in the head and hide the gun in the dumpster, wipe the prints off, <laughs> on his shirt. I don't know. That's just bizarre. And that's considered closed. I'm covering it anyway. There's, someone knows something. When did that happen? Um, I'd have to check my records. I think it was back in uh, late 90s, something like that. No, it was further after that. I think early 2000s. I'd have to look, but that, that one is extremely suspicious. Um, the other case that I'm covering is um, Arnold Archambault and Ruby Bruyer. They live down by Lake Andes, and they picked up their cousin, Tracy. She was in the back seat, and I think she was like 14 at the time, and um, Arnold was 19, and I think Ruby was 17 or 18, and Ruby and Arnold had a baby, but the baby was staying with her family, and they were in the car, um, they went out partying that night, and um, at some point, they reached this intersection right outside of town, and Arnold said, I bet I can spin out. And there's different versions as to what he said and what happened, because Tracy's the only living witness. So her memories of this are blurry and not always consistent. Um, so he says, I'm, I, I think I can spin out here. And he spun out the car. Somehow it ended up upside down in the, in the ditch. And because of that, um, Ruby, and, Ruby and Tracy were trapped in the car. Tracy's in the back seat. Ruby's in the front. Arnold was gone by the time Tracy came to. She said she was knocked out. And um, Arnold was gone. And Ruby was in the front seat saying, oh my God, oh my God, and kicking the dash and kicking the door, trying to get out. She eventually got the door open and squeezed out. And then I suppose it was the uphill side. The door came slamming shut. And then Tracy, I suppose because they're upside down and she's kind of squished, she can't get a door open and she can't get into the front seat to get out that door. So she had to wait until help arrived. And um, she then finally got rescued. And at that time, it was probably, the, oh, this was like, six in the morning that this accident occurred and eventually somebody found her you know, shortly afterward rescued her and they all searched the ditch and on the other side of the ditch is an embankment that goes out over the lake 
and the lake was frozen and um, they had officers out on the lake looking for holes in the ice and in this ditch, there had been water, but it was frozen solid. The car was on top of this frozen solid ice and it didn't break through. But they had people looking up and down the ditch. They had people looking in the fields around there and in the trees. And they never found any trace of Arnold and Ruby whatsoever. And they thought, well, maybe because they'd been drinking, these kids just ran off because they didn't want to be caught for DWI. Um, but this search went on forever and they still never found these kids. Three months later, uh, someone driving by, and I should clarify too, that in the meantime, family members would drive by there and stop and get out and search for them, look for anything, you know, any belongings or any trace of these kids, never found them. And I should say too, that on New Year's Eve, one of the um, friends of Arnold was at a New Year's Eve party and claims that Arnold was in the backseat of a car that had driven up and she went out and addressed these boys and, and there were like two of them in the backseat with Arnold and the one guy driving. And um, she talked to all of them and said, Arnold, where have you been? Everybody's looking for you. Are you guys coming into the party? And they're like, nope, we're not coming into the party. And they drove off and she went and reported that. And police officers are like, wow, you know, okay, we thought he was missing. Um, so they, they did a lie detector test on her and she passed. They did a lie detector test on the other two boys who said, no, he wasn't with us that night. And they failed. <laughs> but it's not enough evidence to, to really um, arrest anyone. And so they thought, well, maybe Arnold still is alive. Maybe Ruby and Arnold are hiding out somewhere. We can't, we can't pursue this if they're still alive and just hiding. Three months later, um, someone was driving by and looking for a hubcap that had gone off their car and saw something in the ditch and got down in the ditch and saw in the water was Ruby. Um, she wasn't frozen to the ground, but she was severely decomposed. And they found her body and 30 feet down the road, they found a clump of her hair. And they said that couldn't have been there all these months. That chunk of hair couldn't have been there all that, all that time. And so then they're thinking, well, if, if Ruby is here, maybe Arnold is here. And so they pumped out the ditch and they found Arnold, who was in the water 15 feet away. And he was almost perfectly preserved. There's even pictures of him on the internet and he looks like he'd just gone to sleep the night before. It's just bizarre. And granted, he was in the water, so that might have protected him a little bit. But, um, but still... Why was Ruby so decomposed? This was in early March and temperatures hadn't been that warm yet. So that doesn't make sense. And the Bill Youngstrom, the guy who was investigating this, I think he was a sheriff's deputy, he said he suspected foul play. He suspected that they were dumped there because neither one of them were frozen to the ground, which they should have been if they were just fine. And neither one of them were frozen to the ground. He thought that maybe Ruby had died much, much earlier, like maybe that night and kept someplace some semi-warm, like in a barn or a shed or something where decomposition could happen. Um, and maybe Arnold had died shortly before then. But the, the weird thing is, this is all weird, but she, uh, her shoes and her glasses were never found. You would think if she had fallen through the ice right there, her shoes and glasses would be there. They were not there. And Arnold was dressed in an outfit that someone thought was different from what he was wearing that night. They, they, they couldn't be sure that he was even wearing that outfit. And in his pocket was a set of keys that um, didn't belong to anything Arnold owned. So it was almost like someone else's clothes were put on Arnold. And those were someone else's keys. They could never figure out what those keys went to. So those are just a couple of the cases that, that I'm finding very intriguing. Um, another one is Mariah Highhawk in Rapid City. Um, her, she lived with her father and mother and um, she was with her boyfriend in her dad's house at her home and they had gotten into an argument <clears throat> and he took her phone and he went and told Delbert, the dad, I'm taking off. She's been texting some guy and I'm mad about it. And so Delbert said, okay, we'll see you. So he took Mariah's phone and Mariah took off out the door after him trying to get his phone, her phone back before he could get very far. So she didn't have shoes or coat on. And um, 
you would think she would just give up down the road and come back home realizing he's too far gone, we'll get it later. But she didn't, so it made Delbert wonder if maybe she got picked up by, um, by the boyfriend. But Delbert said she was fine when she left. There were no injuries on her. Um, there was nothing that indicated that they'd been in a physical altercation. Then um, she never came home and they went looking for her and looking for her. And it was, this was on Friday night, she went missing. And it was on Sunday that they found her kind of stuffed underneath the utility trailer. You know, the kind where you just drive a, drive a mower onto to haul it to another place. She was stuffed under the tire of a, uh, behind the tire of this utility trailer. And um, they called it hypothermia. But Dilbert said, and then they said, there were no drugs in her system. And Delbert said, well, she was on a prescription drug, but it was very low dose. She did not smoke, she did not drink, and she did not do drugs. She had two, she had a little baby and she had a little girl at home. She wouldn't, she wouldn't do it. She was very proud of that fact when so many of her friends did. And so um, then he talked with the person at the um, at the uh, funeral home who, who told him, she met him outside and she said, her collarbone is crushed, her fingers and toes are broken, and she has a contusion on the top of her head. You could just put your finger right into her head. And, um, and then there are pictures of Mariah that I've seen. Her hands are so battered. They're, they're green and bright purple and pink, and you can see that she's, she had a lot of defensive wounds on her hands. And her face was battered, it looked like a bite mark on her lip. So there was obvious trauma to this girl before she died. And there was a footprint on her back. Now, the sad part of this is they claimed it was hypothermia <laughs> that, that killed her. And in their report, they say that there was, no, uh, there was no injury that caused her death. But if you have a contusion to the top of your head and you have broken collarbone and you have broken fingers and toes and you've suffered a heavy beating, you could be in shock. She could have been unconscious and stuffed underneath that trailer and just died of hypothermia because she didn't come to. So yeah, she could have died of hypothermia, but the case is, you know, and then two months later, they said, well, she had drugs in her system. And he said, no, she did not have drugs in her system. You actually came to me and told me that she did not have drugs in her system. So this is the kind of things that, that Native Americans are dealing with. You know, the cases just get slapped with a label just to write them off because there's so many. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little sampling of some of the cases that I'm dealing with. So do you have any questions? Anyone? Have you gotten any reach outs or information from people who may have heard you in some of your media interviews that you've done? That have come back to you on some of the cases. Yeah, and actually, I post about it on Facebook, and sometimes I'll post a list of names. <laughs> you know, I try not to do like hundreds of them. <laughs> I will post like twenty or thirty names and say, if you know of any, if you know family members or friends of any of these people, please have them contact me, and that will get circulated. Like, I never get shares on my Facebook pages, and I don't care because I'm not on there very much. Too much drama. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's just ugly. Um, <laughs> But as a writer, I, it's, it's necessary for, for my business. So I post on my, my author page and list names. And sometimes there might not be anybody who says, I know so-and-so, and I'd be happy to give you information. But they'll say, oh, you're working on this cold case book. Will you cover my son's case? Will you cover my daughter's case? And I've gotten two or three since then, um, just after listing that. And I've gotten the whole case file, you know, all the details to the case, and I've gotten the tributes and so like, and I'm not really choosing who goes into the first book. I'm only going by how many cases I can get. You know, if, if they're going to send me the, if I can find enough information about the case and if the families can get me the tributes, I will put them in the first book, whoever, first come, first serve, you know, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to handpick. I am going to kind of intersperse them a little bit because I don't want it to be um, like all murders and all, all missing persons, that kind of thing. I'm kind of, I'm opening the book with the story of a little um, Rashinda Rubido who was um, abducted and killed. And the, I think I did it because it's just one of those, the saddest stories I'm covering. 
and I'm just heartbroken for her mom. Um, it was the first time her mom ever let her spend the night away from home. It was at their cousin's house. And um, and so they met up at the homecoming parade and, and Richie came up, or Cinda is her name. She came up and said, mom, can I spend the night at the cousin's? And she's like, uh, you know, she just never did it because she said, things happen. Things happen when people stay overnight. I'm not gonna risk it. She's never let any of her kids out of her sight. But that one time, it's at the cousins. Yes, you can go. You'll be home by noon tomorrow. Those were the last words she told Richie. And Richie didn't come home at noon. So the mom went looking for her and the sister went looking for her and they couldn't find her. And um, she was told by local authorities, you can't, you know, she's probably just run away. She's with her cousins. She'll be home. She'll end up at school on Monday. You know, you can't really report her missing until Monday. Probably, and if she's, could be, she just ran away. She's just unhappy. And she said, no, she's not. She's not unhappy. And she had a lot of um, problems just getting law enforcement involved. Monday, she wasn't in school. And that's when Elizabeth really panicked. And she actually went over to the cousin's house a couple different times. And she didn't speak with the Richie's cousins, but she spoke with her cousins who said, we don't know where they're at. We don't know where they're at. Come to find out, Richie's cousins were not um, with Richie. And Richie had been kind of led away by a couple other girls that she knew. And, um, and after that, she was murdered at some point. And um, she reported her mon on Monday. And then shortly <coughs> afterward, um, she wasn't doing a whole lot of, I mean, like the local law enforcement did kind of a cursory search. And then they said, we can't find her. She's probably just hiding out somewhere. And um, you'll find her. And eventually, I think she got um, DCI involved, someone that she knew from DCI. And um, he made posters and he said, let's set up a search party and we're going to get this thing going. The very first search day, they found Richie um, north of town by the, by the sewers underneath some pine trees. And Elizabeth was on her way to Winter because someone said, oh, she's a winner. I heard she was running around winter. 11, she wouldn't be running around winter. How would she even get there, you know? And so she um, she was on her way to winter and her sister stopped her and she said, sissy, they found they found Richie. And Elizabeth, of course, you don't, your mind doesn't want you to believe the worst. She said, oh, good. I, I won't need these posters anymore. Wow, I bet she's hungry. She must be hungry. Let's let's go home. And she said, "No, sister, you don't understand. She's dead." And she just screamed and screamed and said, "No, that can't be right. You take me to her. I want to see her right now." And they went to the site, but of course they wouldn't let her see her because she was she'd been dead for a few days, and and um, she still doesn't have any details about how Richie died. Um, they won't let her see any autopsy reports, and so it's just hard thing all the way around. So she's the first story in the book. Did I answer your question? I don't know what it was. <laughs> yeah, okay. so it was just was about context. Oh, yeah, 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 I do. I do get to Are you satisfied with evidence in Pam and Cheryl's case? Do you Pardon think me? that it's, are you satisfied with evidence in Pam and Cheryl's case that it's, Absolutely. that's all what? Yeah. Right. Yep. I still don't believe that one. Yeah. I I have a really, I mean, we're friends with Lickens, but I have a really hard time believing that David, this puny little 15-year-old at the time, could overpower two girls in a car and manage to be able to hide them both. And when the girls, when the girls disappeared, just the circumstances of the case were, um, were a little too, they were a little too perfect to ignore. Um, the girls were following these boys, and we know a couple of them, they were following these boys. On the, they met him at Gary Owen and followed them up the, the oil road, turned at the road, the gravel road to go toward the gravel pit. The girls were following these boys and um, the boys missed the turn into the driveway to the gravel pit and went over the hill. The girls were still following them. They missed the turn and went over the hill. And by the time they, they're like, oh crap, we missed the turn. They turned around and came back. The girls were not there. They went to the party. And what had happened is the girls had lost control and gone into the ditch and they were probably fighting for their life at the time that the boys drove into the gravel pit. And they were still there. And I understand people's suspicions that a car can't be in that creek that long and not be discovered. We had a tornado go around our place and hit our neighbor's bin. And the bin ended up in, in, the, um, in the creek. It wasn't a very big one. It was just an old thing, rusty thing. 
and it ended up in the creek. And that bin stayed there. And we had floods several times and we had droughts several times. That thing never moved. It never moved. It rusted, it, it, it embedded itself into the sediment, but it never moved. And that thing is still there. And it's kind of collapsing now because it's so rusted. But I have a really hard time believing that David had anything to do with it. And, um, and it also was proven that Aloysius, the guy who said that David had confessed on tape, had, had admitted that he lied. You know, is that cold case that investigated that in South Dakota, that cold case team, is that still going? I don't think they are. Yeah. They were out in Rapid City and um, uh, Officer Toms out there said that he still has the names of all of these people if I wanted to contact them, which I think would be helpful because they might have access to more records than I do. Um, but they might have um, a little bit more knowledge about how to go about this. Um, so I think just the fact that I have most of the cases already investigated for the first book and have most of the family contacted, I'll probably um, contact them about the remaining cases because those are the ones I don't have a lot of information on yet. Um, but yeah, I think that would be beneficial to have a, a cold case um, unit in South Dakota. And I even thought about doing it myself, but I don't, I don't know if I want to. <laughs> This, this is overwhelming enough. And eventually, you know, like I told when we went to our investment broker the other day, and the girls in the office were like, do you have any new books coming out? And I said, well, as soon as I get this cold case book done, then I'll work on the third book in the series. But no, not, not right now. And they're like, oh, how's the cold case book going? And I said, it's fine. I'm <laughs> still researching and Googling stuff. And I said, I, you know, there's just so much, so many hours in the seat and so many hours spent on the computer researching and going through all these rabbit holes. And I said, I just want to get back to writing fiction and making stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't use the word stuff either. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I much more enjoy um, fiction, um, but I kind of feel like I want to have my life have some purpose to it. And even if none of these cases get solved, it was an effort. And in my opinion, it keeps these people's lives, these people's faces and their names alive a little bit longer. Because I feel like you can post on Facebook and you can put out a newspaper article on an anniversary or a birthday or whatever. Um, you, can, you can have it in a podcast, but those are fleeting. I mean, they're out and then they're gone and forgotten. But with a book, I think, especially if it ends up on somebody's shelf, um, it's gonna get read, especially if there are several cases in there, it's gonna get passed around, it's gonna get talked about. And I just feel like I'll be able to keep these, these people alive a little bit longer. So, any other questions? No? Okay, well, you're welcome to come over and look at my books if you want, or buy one, or just steal a chocolate, <laughs> <laughs> take a business card. That's your chocolate, it's right in the little boat. <laughs> I know, isn't that cute? <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. Um, please help yourself to refreshment. Oh, yeah. Thank you everybody that joined us on Zoom as well. Yeah. 23 minutes past my bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>